bom dia. Eu estou muito feliz de estar aqui com vocês hoje, apresentando o professor Paul Stoller, a quem agradeço muito por ter aceito o convite da Reunião Brasileira de Antropologia. Eu quero comentar um pouco como eu conheci o professor e por que para mim é tão grato este momento. Eu li Paul Stoller pela primeira vez em 2005, no comecinho do meu doutorado, quando realizei um curso de antropologia ritual com a minha professora daquele momento e hoje amiga Antonadia Borges. O texto que me iniciou em Stoller foi o artigo Sound and Things, Pulsation of Power in Songhai, do livro de Performance of Healing, organizado por Carol Lederman e Marina Roseman. Após a leitura desse artigo, eu senti alguma transformação dentro de mim que durante muito tempo eu não soube explicar. Havia algo na descrição do Guzzi, que um violino de uma corda só, do tambor gassi, da prática do praise naming, que me levou a uma outra dimensão corporal. Não foi apenas imaginar esses sons, mas a própria descrição etnográfica me convidava a escutar e sentir esses sons. O Gucci clama, diz Stoller, sublinhando que, através desse lamento, fala nos ancestrais. O poder de suas vozes une os vivos com seu passado. São, como ele diz, poderes sonoros que podem trazer a chuva, erradicar pestilências e prevenir epidemias. Em um contexto sociocultural como o de Songhai, não escutar o mundo é aprender pouco sobre ele. Se para eles o som é o transporte dos espíritos, pergunta-se Stoller como limitar a visão, como reduzir o som do Guji às anotações de página. Não é possível conhecer o mundo em Songhai se não conseguimos escutá-lo. Stoller aprendeu isso em uma experiência em que um espírito se apresentou a ele e a Jivo, seu mestre, seu primeiro mestre em fetichería antes do Adamuja e Tongo, mas cuya presença Stoller não percebeu. Decepcionado, Divo responde, olhas, mas não vês, tocas, mas não sentes, escutas, mas não ouves. Sem ver nem tocar, podemos aprender muito, mas deves aprender a ouvir, senão aprenderás muito pouco sobre nós. Não é possível conhecer o mundo se não conseguimos escutá-lo. Foi uma frase simples, mas extremadamente profunda, que transformou Stoller no etnógrafo que ele se tornou, e me fez entender que havia algo da prática antropológica que até aquele momento me escapava. Quis saber mais do autor e rapidamente li eh, e procurei The Taste of Ethnographic Things, The Sense, the sense in Anthropology. De novo, entrei no universo sensorial e aprendi que há uma riqueza inigualável naquilo que ele chamou de antropologia dos sentidos. Com nossos ouvidos plenamente sintonizados, está uma cita dele, a natureza existencial do som, podemos perceber melhor o inatingível e atravessar limiares em direção aos recantos profundos da experiência de um povo. Em Songhai, o som é mais do que um meio para entrar em trance, é uma fundação da experiência, diz Stoller em O Gosto das Coisas Etnográficas. Depois de saborear este livro, precisei saber mais do autor. Mas antes, li autores que ele citava e que eu ainda não conhecia, como Steven Feld. Fiquei pensando durante um tempo se o enorme apelo que essas etnografias tinham em mim não se devia à minha paixão pela música. Mas por que associar meu prazer por Stoller a meu prazer pela música? Talvez porque o apelo do Stoller está justamente em mostrar que quando se trata de música, há muito mais em jogo do que fenômenos sonoros. Ele foi afetado pelo Gucci, pelo Gaxi e, pelo, e pelas preces, não apenas pelo som, mas por aquilo que o som coloca em movimento, aquilo que nos afeta porque desperta sensibilidades e movimenta forças e energias no corpo, nos sentidos e que enche na experiência de significados. Isso muito me remexe ao tambor e aos mantras de exorcismo, quando o autor chama a atenção para a necessidade de se entender o significado dos mantras, não apenas a través do entendimento de palavra por palavra, nem apenas a partir de uma análise das formas verbais, como se fosse uma categoria diferenciada, mas mediante as sequências nas quais as palavras são ditas, em relação a seu sentido emocional e a seu carácter sagrado, relatado em canções, corações e bênçãos. Seria o sentido emocional da música o que me levou a sentir o Stoller? Posso responder que sim, mas não apenas. 
há em Stoller um chamado e uma crítica muito perspicaz à etnografia, uma conversa de proximidade e afastamento com a antropologia interpretativa e um respeito pelo trabalho de campo longo e comprometido, que seria de fato um empirismo radical, um experimento fenomenológico profundo de se adentrar nos sentidos e no corpo pois o corpo é a base da aprendizagem sensual, sensorial e perceptiva do mundo. Nele se fusionam o inentingível, o inteligível e o sensível. Sobre as influências do Stoller, eh, Merleau-Ponty, Schultz, Rutsch, Fabrice Sadat, eh, Marcelo vai falar daqui a pouco. Logo depois, li In Sorcery's Shadow, aquele que foi seu primeiro livro de corte mais biográfico sobre sua experiência de aprendiz de feiticeiro e mais recentemente li eh, Judges History. Mas a obra de Paul Stoller é muito extensa, ao redor de 12 livros, romances entre eles. Sempre quis traduzir Stoller, mas naquele momento, 2005, jamais imaginei que me tornaria editora. Quando me tornei, em 2016, Stoller reapareceu em minha mente como uma obsessão. Traduzir The Taste of Enography Things é algo parecido ao que chamamos de destino ou de fetichismo. Encontrei Marcelo em Florianópolis, em um congresso de antropologia em 2018, e lhe comentei sobre esse sonho. Eu sabia que ele, sendo um especialista em possessão, poderia se interessar. Te agradeço muito, Marcelo, por ter tido a generosidade de adentrar comigo nessa empreitada que significa muito para mim. Espero que muita mais gente leia Paul Stoller e que o som e o sabor de suas palavras possam ser tão inspiradoras quanto foram para mim, ou muito mais. Estamos frente a uma antropologia dos sentidos que tem muito a ensinar aos antropólogos em formação, mas também aos experientes. Estamos frente a uma proposta radical de etnografia. Muito obrigada. Saudações a todas e a todos. Eu vou dar continuidade aqui à apresentação e queria agradecer primeiramente a diretoria da ABA, Carolina, Matheus, especialmente a Maria Ovira e ao Paul Stoller por estar aqui conosco. Bom, é, Paul Stoller é professor na Universidade de Westchester e é autor de obra copiosa. Em seus livros, que intercalam gêneros textuais diversos, a descrição de experiências e encontros subjetivos serve como fio condutor para abordar tópicos caros da antropologia, como parentesco, a magia, a feitiçaria, os rituais de cura, sistemas de conhecimento, o colonialismo, a autoridade política, o corpo e os sentidos. Sua produção relata sobre percursos, intersecções, encontros e desencontros redimensionam as vivências e os aprendizados decorrentes do convívio prolongado com comerciantes da África Ocidental, no Harlem, em Nova York, em especial com um o Solgai do Níger. Toda essa a, a própria jornada do Stoller está narrada no livro uh, The Power of the Between, o qual eu recomendo. Bom, o primeiro contato de Stoller com o se dá em 1969 e o motiva a cursar pós-graduação, primeiramente na Universidade de Georgetown, onde fez mestrado em sociolinguística, e posteriormente na Universidade do Texas, em Austin, onde obteve o doutorado em Antropologia Linguística. Em 76, regressa ao Níger para realizar pesquisa de campo para o seu doutorado, se aproximando ainda mais de pessoas como Digibo e Adamu Genitone. Desde 76 até 87, então, Stoller retoma, retorna anualmente ao campo, instruindo-se nas artes da feitiçaria, da cura, da possessão espiritual, de fórmulas rituais secretas, de encantamentos rituais, das artes da divinação e do uso de plantas. Essa experiência de campo visceral alterou seu próprio modo de se orientar no mundo. Suas obras mais conhecidas, dentre as quais uh, In Sorcery's Shadow, Fusion of the Words and Embodying Colonial Memories, decorrem desse convívio prolongado com o Songhai. Entre essas obras, destaca o gosto das coisas etnográficas, os sentidos na antropologia a obra publicada em 1989, e que eu tive o privilégio de traduzir. Em diálogo com autores como Clifford Geertz e, e outros autores ditos pós-modernos, Stoller trata, neste livro, das convenções representacionais da disciplina. Mas vai muito além. 
né? Em monografias experimentais como essa, o, Stoller, o autor narra percursos, intersecções, jornadas, trajetos, desvios, dimensões nas quais a sensorialidade da pesquisa etnográfica ganha relevo. O gosto e o sabor constituem uma forma de experimentação crítica, tanto com os pressupostos realistas da disciplina, tanto com convenções representacionais. Mas, no nível mais profundo, Trata-se de abordar as predisposições sensoriais de pesquisadores e pesquisadoras de campo. Inspirado, então, em filósofos como Wittgenstein, Horty, uh, Derrida e Meloponti, Stoller explora as relações complexas entre percepção, poder e experiência de vida. Além da fenomenologia, dialoga com a antropologia produzida na França, de autores desde Le Ries até uh, Fradette Sadá, em especial com Jean Rouch, com quem conviveu longamente, sobre quem também escreveu um livro. Lembrando que Ruth foi especialista também no Níger. Bom, é difícil resumir em poucas palavras né, é, o gosto das coisas etnográficas. Eu destacaria aqui a tentativa do autor de demonstrar como, nas tradições intelectuais ocidentais, os sentidos foram relegados a um papel inferior no próprio processo de construção do conhecimento. Ao mesmo tempo, a elevação da visão a um estatuto privilegiado relegou às margens sentidos como o tato e o olfato. O curso das coisas etnográficas mergulha profundamente nos nossos modos de conhecer e aprender o mundo. Imbuídos de leituras prévias, de técnicas investigativas e de sistemas de análise, pesquisadores e pesquisadoras de campo portam consigo também pressupostos metafísicos, refletidos nos seus modos de perceber, sentir e experienciar o mundo. Nessa obra, tão marcada pela descrição de percursos, há um convite, então, para habitar um mundo sensível por meio do corpo, da corporeidade, de modo a desafiar os alicerces do nosso ser no mundo e refletir mais apropriadamente sobre as relações entre experienciar, conhecer e, e ser. Bom, nesse ano de 2022, né, que marca o centenário da publicação de Agonautas do Pacífico Ocidental, a tradução do gosto das coisas etnográficas, os sentidos na antropologia, deve ser celebrada. Né? Promovida pela editora Papéis Selvagens, eu tenho só a agradecer a Maria Elvira, é, não só pelo convite, pela confiança, mas pela troca e também por realmente uma oportunidade de se tornar mais sensível, digamos assim, a uma série de coisas, inclusive sobre a própria experiência etnográfica. Agradeço também a Paul Stoller, né? Por, pela acolhida e por sempre estar disposto a conversar e tirar dúvidas. né? E, para encerrar, chama atenção para uma declaração de Stoller em uma entrevista recente. Disse ele, dentre outras coisas, a antropologia é uma ciência vagarosa em um mundo acelerado. Afinal, demora-se anos para aprender adequadamente outra língua, ter ensaios teóricos e a se orientar mesmo no mundo. O investimento temporal na pesquisa antropológica que pressupõe convívio, aprendizado longos com outros e outras, vai na contramão, então, do ritmo dos nossos tempos. Retorno aos sentidos envolve, para Stoller, desacelerar. Uma antropologia sensorial, por definição, demanda trabalho de campo de longa duração, convívio prolongado e respeitoso com interlocutores e interlocutoras, um reordenamento sensorial e perceptivo radical, um balanceamento mais adequado entre o sensível e o inteligível. Envolve também imersão nas texturas da vida, abertura para as artes, disposição para habitar outros mundos nos quais as experiências têm distintas camadas e texturas, sendo permeadas por sabores, aromas, toques, visões, cheiros e sons que redefinem as próprias maneiras de ser e estar no mundo. Com o Stoller, então, temos um convite para uma antropologia sensível. Obrigado. Good morning, everyone. What a pleasure and honor it is for me to present uh, this lecture to the uh, Association of Brazilian Anthropologists. Um, I'm particularly honored by Elvira and Marcelo for having taken the time and uh, the perseverance to translate my book, The Tran Taste for Ethnographic Things, uh, from English into Portuguese. It's been a very Uh, a long journey, but uh, a good one. And Marcelo, I must say, has done a magnificent job of translating uh, my, particular, my, my particularities in English 
into uh, into Portuguese into Portuguese. He's very, been very very careful about that, and I'm very very pleased um, uh, with the work that he's done. And I'm extraordinarily happy to um, have uh, my my book translated into Portuguese, so that um, what insights that I have can be read by a, a larger audience of people. So um, Brazilian anthropologists, and, and specifically, so. We live in troubled times, and um, I was particularly happy to note that the theme of this year's uh, Association of Brazilian Anthropologists is um, about uh, doing anthropology in extreme times, um, we, and we live in extreme times. Uh, obviously, uh, there are you know the extreme times are very evident in Brazil. They certainly are evident in the United States, given the the, the quality of our uh, politics. But uh, extreme times exist worldwide. And where I do my research in Republic of Niger, um, there have been some extreme times as well. So in the past two years, in the region where I've done my research in <clears throat> uh, Tilbury, Niger, in western part of Niger, <clears throat> there have been armed gangs of uh, sort of Islamic inspired, but not, they're really brigands who have gone in the countryside into villages where pe I know people and they've gone and they've looted, they've robbed, they've killed people, <clears throat> they exact ransom. Um, and the, the place that I knew as a younger field worker uh, no longer exists. Uh, I harbor wonderful memories of Tilbury and that part of Western Niger, the majestic Niger River, um, sweeping vista. I remember vistas of the Niger River. Um, I remember the sandstone buttes. Um, I remember the smells of the kebabs cooking on makeshift grills. Uh, and I lived for many, many years in a dune top compound that overlooked uh, the Niger River Valley uh, with my teacher, Adamu Genitongo. Um, and it was the site of many compellingly beautiful rituals that I was able to attend, a lot of spirit, position, spirit possession rituals that I was able to uh, attend. <clears throat> and these were held without any sort of incidents. There was no sort of restriction on holding these kinds of traditional ceremonies. But once, what had once been a social life there in Tilbury, Niger, uh, characterized by widespread tolerance, uh, has been replaced by religious zealotry. And so the dysfunction has shredded the social social fabric in Tilbury uh, in Niger, but of course, as I said before, it's not an isolated uh, it's not an isolated uh, phenomenon. There's dysfunction everywhere in the world today, it seems. Um, so we live in a world where, where we can no longer ignore systematic racism, uh, ethnic discrimination, religious intolerance, uh, severe income inequality. Not to forget the social and economic devastation of the coronavirus epidemic. So my question today is, you know, uh, how can we anthropologists meet the challenges of our troubled times? How can we do that? And I'm going to suggest uh, in my, my, uh, my comments today that, um, that, you know, we have to confront our obligations as scholars and admit that many of our longstanding set of methods and denotative conventions uh, of representation are no longer in sync with the state of contemporary, uh, uh, contemporary issues in the world, right? So uh, they're no longer in sync with the sort of systematic dysfunction that we are experiencing, uh, social dysfunction in the world. So, uh, how do we, how will we be able to get through these issues? How are we going to be able to, you know, uh, uh, feed our children and keep them safe? Um, and how are we going to deal with the sort of social ravages of COVID-19, which shows no sign of letting up? Uh, and of course, there will be probably other pandemics that leap from the from the wilderness to the village. Um, how are we going to cope with that? And how, how are we going to cope with the social change that that uh, uh, in, involves? 
Of course, in anthropology, we know a great deal about these existential issues, a great deal. Because, um, but we have a lot of insight about how to deal with these kinds of issues. But because of our reliance on established conventions of representation, our insights are often admittedly uh, limited. They have a limited appeal. We have these great insights from uh, about indigenous wisdom, about the practical wisdom of, of the others that we uh, attempt to describe. And yet uh, most people don't know what we do or are unaware of the kind of insights that we harbor in the ethnographic rep rec record. So to meet these existential challenges uh, of contemporary times, I, uh, I'm going to propose, you know, that we, the anthropologists plunge into what I like to call the art of ethnography, the art of ethnography, in, in which we engage the senses, we engage the senses to articulate dimensions of locality, language, and character. And I, I would suggest that we borrow techniques from film, poetry, fiction, to craft ethnographic narratives uh, in text and film that can connect the public to the idiosyncrasies of people and place. In so doing, I argue that artful, artful ethnography has the potential to bring to the public sphere, um, bring to the public sphere uh, a nuanced wisdom of others, the very foundation really of anthropological insight. Uh, in our current circumstances, um, you know, um, so such a wisdom can set a course that ultimately leads, I'm con confident, to meaningful change and social justice. Um, so how do we do that? Um, how do we create a body of work that showcases the inspirational resilience of human beings uh, in the world? So for me, um, the art of ethnography begins with uh, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, uh, and especially his brief text, uh, I in Mind, one of the great, you know, very short texts, but one of the most, uh, for me, inspirational texts of 20th century philosophy. And um, he suggests that in a work of art, you know, work of art is a pathway to an embodied enlightenment that can enable us to practice what Michael ja Jackson, my colleague Michael Jackson, has called the art of life. And the key premise of I and Mind is that nature, as the artist Paul Cezanne suggested, is on the inside. And so what Merleau-Ponty's uh, idea about art is, is that it is a way to uh, enable us to express that which is on the inside, to express what he called the there is. Um, and so his ideas are a crit critique of scientific positivism. And, um, and so he, he believed that the painter is one of our guides on the path to what he called the there is. The painter savors the life that resides in the inner dimensions of things. Indeed, the painter, like other artists, feels the reverberations that can create awareness in the eye and mind of the person who confronts the sensory splendor of the world. And so uh, his writing is not some vague sort of, uh, you know, mystical journey. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not in, into the unseen or the sensory unconscious. Um, he suggested artists are a guide to the there is because they open their being to the world. They open their being to the world. They let the world enter their being. Uh, which, you know, they let the world enter their being, and in this way they change the world into paintings, according to Merleau-Ponty. Put another way, painting is a metaphor for sensing the world from the inside. The idea is underscored by the Swiss, you know, Swiss-born painter Paul Klee, who in his lectures talks about how when he's in a forest, he lets the forest enter his body, um, let it, enters his being, in this, and he paints as a way of breaking out of that. So this kind of opening one's being to the world that we are trying to understand. And of course, when you do that, um, you know, when you do that, uh, what happens is that uh, it is a risky proper proposition. If you open your world to the being, uh, to the, uh, to the uh, 
to others, to the being of others, uh, or the being of the forest, it uh, is a risky population. You're taking a risk. It is not an easy thing to do, but the, the artistic rewards of it are profound. So consider, I'm going to quote here, uh, Friedrich Nietzsche's th thoughts on this notion of art and science and scientific intelligibility. This is what he wrote in, uh, you know, the uh, he, he wrote this in the 1870s. He wrote that the mission of science is to make existence intelligible, thereby justified, uh, thereby make, thereby justified. Um, Socrates and his successors down to our day have considered all moral and sentimental accomplishments noble deeds, um, compassion, self-sacrifice, heroism, to be ultimately derived from a dialectic of knowledge and therefore teachable. But science, spurred on by its energetic notions, approaches irresistibly those outer limits where the optimism of logic must collapse. When the inquirer, having pushed to the circumference, realizes how logic in that place curls about itself and bites its own tail, he is struck with a new kind of perception, a tragic perception, which requires to make it tolerable the remedy of art. So by way of Cezanne, uh, Paul Clay, Merleau-Ponty. Um, so how do we use this sort of notion of art how do we infuse it into um, our anthropological writings, right? So, um, because really the deep exploration of human of the human condition requires for Merleau-Ponty the remedy of art, which for him is evocation or showing um, as well as telling, right? And so he says about the power of evocation in art, uh, Merleau-Ponty has this uh, to say, the words, the lines, and the colors which express me come from me as my gestures are torn from me by what I want to say. The way my gestures are and by what I want to do. In the art of prose, words carry the speaker and listener into a common universe by drawing both toward a new signification through their power to designate in excess of their accepted definition. And he says, the words most charged with philosophy, Merleau-Ponty writes, are not necessarily those that contain what they say, but rather those that most energetically open upon being, because they are more, most, they are more closely convey the life of the whole and make our habitual, uh, habitual vibrate until they disjoin. In this way, writers or painters, for that matter, use what Merleau-Ponty calls the indirect voice to evoke the brute and wild being of the world. So, so my summary of the sort of political and social cultural instability of Tilbury, the United States, Brazil, suggests that we live in complex and unstable times. Uh, that's for sure. There are no quick fi fixes, um, answers to the political, social, and intellectual problems of the current era. Given the multiplex, multiplex whys and wherefores of contemporary life, is it still possible to make sense of the human condition? Can we apprehend Merleau-Ponty's brute and wild being? And if we can experience such a revelatory and brute consciousness, will it deepen our sensibilities, our capacities to understand the imponderables of living in the world? Do artists and anthropologists have a role to play in this important contemporary endeavor? You know, what can Merleau-Ponty's eye and mind teach us about confronting the darkness that has swept over contemporary social life? Can we squeeze small measures of well being from the speedy chaos of social life? Can anthropological insight chart a path that leads to a life well lived? In two of Michael Jackson's recent latest books, one on reinventing philosophical anthropology, the other um, on the uh, art of, um, uh, one on the power of shaping uh, art and shaping the contours of social life. Uh, Michael Jackson explores these questions with a powerful pers perspicacity. So um, he says that the spaces that we live in escape 
brute categorization. They're spaces that are defiantly non-concrete, spaces that require the evocation of art and artful scholarship. So, um, you know, his, his, both of these works, both published in 2016, are wonderfully, as in all of Michael Jackson's works, are wonderfully crafted. Um, and so, you know, he, he gives us a, a roadmap to the space that, you know, according to Nietzsche, logic curls up and bites its own tail. So these, these spaces are different. They are opaque. And so after, a, you know, after 40 years of uh, doing field work uh, in West Africa and Australia, after a lifetime of reading and reflection, writing about living in the world, Jackson describes how that experience directed him to follow the sinuous, non-totalizing path between things, between the one and the many, between identity and difference, between ourselves and others, between the personal and the professional, between our um, between the belief and experience, between being and thought, between fate and free will, between center and periphery. So, uh, in, in one book is called "As Wide as the World Is Wise," and is it artfully explores the imaginative spaces between anthropology and philosophy, uh, and it's you know and and uh, just a, a beautiful evocation of the sort of commonalities and differences between anthropology and philosophy and how they can sort of mutually inform one another. And so he gives a lots of, uh, you know, a lot, Jackson provides a, you know, lots of ethnographic and experiential examples that demonstrate how our anthropological and philosophical thinking can never englobe everything. Uh, there is always something that escapes, Jackson says. Things are always impermanent. Our experience, feelings, and thoughts are continuously evolving. Our lived reality is one that confounds everyday certainty. We are all in the between. In life, we find ourselves, and I quote Jackson here, a perpetual oscillation between engaging with the world and seeking distance, respite or release from it. No matter what vernacular idiom is employed to capture this oscillation, philosopher's hut, the open field, the contrast between town and bush, theological images of earth and ether, existential tensions between home and the world, the dilemma persists of how to balance and reconcile these competing imperatives or discover how one can live with their incommensurability, end quote. So how can we live in this intellectual and experienced turbulence of the between? How can we bear the intellectual and existential fruits of cultivating what Keats long ago called negative capability, the capacity to live with incommensurability the inchoateness of which, uh, of which stretches the imagination and sparks creativity. And he considers these questions in his second, the second book of 2016, The Work of Art, uh, where he tacks between personal reflection and interpretation of various, uh, various group of art, artists, including mesmerizing productions of Australian Aborigines, uh, Aboriginal artists. By way of his analysis, uh, Jackson demonstrates how art is not an inert element of representation, but a dynamic force that can transform life. The work of art then can enable us to open our being to the world, prompting writers and painters, anthropologists to see and think from the inside. So in the end, he says, the art of life, and I'm quoting him again, is thus an art of making the world appear perennially new by what Rambeau called a long, immense, and uh, um, en langue immense et raisonnant des règlements de, de tous sens, an endless play of light and dark, bitter and sweet, sound and silence, hard and soft, acrid and fragrant, against the grain of inscribed habits of thought, action and perception, art, whether graphic, sculptural, musical, verbal, gestural or kinesic, involves a honing, a practicing, a play of, of our sensibilities, which brings us to a place that seems to surpass the familiar, the known, the expected, surprising us, taking, a, taking our breath away, opening our eyes, transforming our understanding and ultimately recreating ourselves. So between the lines of this book, Jackson demonstrates that art can transport us to 
the creative and imaginative spaces between things. He shows us how art can shape our being in the world, transforming our inner turmoil into the outward beauty of prose, poetry, drama, sculpture, and painting. Works that move us. So how does this correspond to the art of, you know, what I call the art of ethnography? Can anthropologists, most of whom have conducted extensive field work, follow obscure tracks that crisscross the deserts of academic discourse and find illumination? Can we, following the insights of Merleau-Ponty's I Am Mind and Michael Jackson's uh, various works, embrace the art of ethnography? In the end, can we learn how to convey to the public our important and slowly developed insights about the human condition? So in, in the past, you know, many scholars reduced ethnography to a set of practices. Ethnographers, after all, conduct fieldwork in a variety of settings. And fieldwork consists of Malinowski's, of course, celebrated, if not conceptually flawed, notion of participant observation being there. And trying to observe while you participate, of course, is no easy feat. Even so, thousands of ethnographers have attempted this oxymoron oxymoronic method as they struggle to conduct a census, engage in informal uh, and semi-formal interviews, uh, or attend a ritual, uh, which they may photograph or film. In the same vein, ethnographers are supposed to record their participant observations in field notes, some purely observational, some more personal. These field notes combined with the field photographs and field films become the foundation for constructing a representation. In the end, these ethnographic texts or films contribute to the ethnographic record. Is this not the set of procedures that we teach our graduate students? Beyond the rigorous set of rules that define ethnographic research, the potential distinctiveness of ethnographic text often gets lost in the fog of institutional expectation. The expected anthropological monograph should have an introduction, a review of the literature, presentation of data, a discussion of the data, and a conclusion in which the work's disciplinary significance, which the author has stated in the introduction, is reaffirmed. These academic conventions of representation more often than not lead to the production of turgid texts of limited appeal. They are important, but they are, have a limited appeal. Given the economic privations of contemporary publishing, publishers uh, now have a less than enthusiastic interest, at least in the United States, this is the case, in publishing uh, anthropological works. One way to change this representational dilemma is to engage in the art of ethnography, in which writers sensuously articulate dimensions of locality, language, and character. Borrowing the thoughts of Merleau-Ponty and techniques from film, poetry, and fiction, artfully inspired ethnographers can craft uh, ethnographic descriptions such that readers come to know the dynamic idiosyncrasies of people and place. And so doing an artful, artful ethnography has the potential to spread slowly developed important anthropological insights far and wide. So an artful ethnography, first of all, can bring to life ethnographic spaces and places. One of the key things about ethnography is it, it, it describes, you know, if it's really well done, sensuously, a place or a space. It gives ethnography... Um, gives a reader a sense of locality. One of the great gifts of ethnography is it brings, it's one of the great gifts that we bring to the world. How can writers use words to sensuously describe a landscape, a wall, a road, a house, or a room? For me, writers should try to describe a space or a place as if it were alive with feelings and memories. As strange it may, as it may seem, writers should attempt to let the sights, smells, sounds and texture of a space place dictate how to describe it. This technique borrows from Paul Clay's aforementioned technique of opening his being to the forest and, and painting it to break out. In this painterly style of um, describing ethnographic spaces, it is important to highlight salient features. It also is important to imagine what a particular room, house, tree, or pathway has witnessed. When I recently observed the majestic baobab tree, which grows next to the Institute of Afri African Studies at the University of Ghana, I wondered what history had that tree 
witnessed. So sensuously setting an ethnographic scene can captivate readers, compelling contemporary readers to turn the page. The great challenge of any writer is to write something that encourages the reader to turn the page. In a world of distraction, uh, that is a task that beca has become increasingly difficult. So how do you get a reader to turn the page? Um, here are some examples in which writers evoke space and place. Consider one of the great writers of the 20th century, James Agee, author of Now Let Us Praise Famous Men. It's an ethnography of life in rural Alabama uh, during the American Depression. He just listened to this short description of a sharecropper's house and how sensuous it is. Every few minutes, George would get up and open the door a foot or so, and it showed always the same picture. That end of the hallway, mud and underwater, where the planks lay flush to the ground. The opposite wall, the open kitchen, brown leaves beyond the kitchen window, a segment of clay, uh, of a clay rear yard, where rain beat on rain, beat on rain, beat on rain, as would beat out the brains of the earth and stood in a bristling smoky grass of water a foot high. A more contemporary example of sensuous ethnographic scene setting comes from Anna Bodkin, who is a writer of creative nonfiction. And she's worked in uh, Afghanistan. She's also worked in, uh, in, uh, in Senegal and West Africa and also in Mali. Uh, this is a, a short excerpt from her 2018 work called Fisherman's Blues, a West Afri African community at sea. So how, follow how she describes Dawn uh, at a sea, uh, dawn at sea near Jaouel, Senegal's largest artisanal fishing port. Dawn spur spills astern, lavender, violet, golden. Capillary waves gently scale the ocean all the way to the horizon. Wind clots low fog. The Sakari Square glides at full throttle west southwest, rolls over lazy six foot, six foot swells. The shore's low skyline of baobab, eucalyptus, and doom palm flashes in the light, sinks into the sea. Its bruised cumulus vanishes too. Black against a banded east, a seabird, an early riser, falls out of the fog and scoops something out of the water and banks away. The pirog, the pirog six crew balance, um, uh, six crew balance spread eagle on the thwarts and on the foredeck dig their bare souls into the slippery wood, learn one into one, lean into one another, and watch the sea for fish. In my own uh, attempt to, to do this kind of sensuous evocation, um, here's a scene from uh, one of my ethnographies, uh, Fusion of the Worlds, uh, to set the scene of a spirit possession ceremony. Clack, a sharp sound shattered the hot, dry air above Tilbury. Another clack followed by a roll and another clack, roll, clack, pulse through the stagnant air. The sound seemed to burst from the dune that overlooked the secondary school of a town of a thousand people, mostly Songhai speaking in the Republic of Niger. The echoing staccato broke the sweaty boredom of a hot afternoon in the hottest town in one of the hottest countries in the world. And like a large hand guided hearers up the dune to Ottawa Genitongo's compound to witness a, a possession, spirit possession ceremony. The compound's three foot millet stock fence enclosed Adam Genitango's dwellings, four, four straw huts that looked like beehives. At the compound's threshold, the high pitched whine of the monochord violin greeted me. Inside I saw three drummers seated under a canopy behind gourd drums. <clears throat> Although the canopy shielded them from the blistering Nigerian sun, a sweat steamed down, uh, um, um, uh, sweat streamed down their faces. Their sleeveless tunics clung to their bodies. Patches of salt had dried white on the surface of their black cotton garments. They continued their rolling beat. Seated behind them on a stool was the violinist dressed in a red shirt that, co that covered his knees. Despite the intensity of the heat and the noise of the crowd, his face remained expressionless as he made his instrument cry. So the sensuous, so uh, the sensuous description of power of uh, place is, is a key, a key in the re in the recipe for doing um, uh, artful ethnography. Another key thing is dialogue. Um, in artful writing, 
what can be more difficult than creating dialogue? Dialogue is a very difficult uh, thing to produce. In much of anthropological writing, dialogue uh, does, doesn't really exist. We have large, you know, quotes from, uh, you know, from transcripts from uh, interviews that we conduct. Um, but uh, artful dialogue is, is more often than not absent in uh, ethnographic texts. So, inform, quote unquote, informant texts are often relegated to, uh, you know, transcribed interviews, which give an indication of the you know, usually gives no indication of the idiosyncrasies. Uh, of a person's speech or their, you know, no clue to, clue to their character, right? So, um, you know, in artful ethnography, scholars can borrow dialogue techniques from fiction and creative nonfiction writers who use them to convey important information and build cat category, uh, I'm sorry, to build character. Um, so uh, some of the writers who write the best dialogue that I've encountered are um, mystery writers. Uh, so one of my favorite is a guy named Walter Mosley. He's an African-American uh, writer who writes about uh, detectives in Los Angeles and New York. And he's one of the best, uh, best uh, you know, writers of dialogue that I've, that I've uh, encountered. Here's a short example from his 2005 novel, Cinnamon Kiss, which, he, which features a conversation between Easy Rollins, one of his you know, recurring characters in his crime novels, and Cynthia, Cynthia Aubeck. Hi, my name is Ezekiel Robbins. I held out my hand. A big grin across, uh, came across her, but somehow uh, the mirth didn't make it to her eyes. She shook my hand. Can I help you? I'm a private detective down in LA, I said. I've been hired to find a woman named Philomena Cargill by her family. Cinnamon, the woman said without hesitation. Axel's friend. That's Axel Bowers, Bowers? Yes, he's my partner here. She looked around the storefront. I did too. Not very lucrative business, I speculated. The woman laughed. It was a real laugh. That depends on how you see, what you see as profit, Mr. Rollins. Axel and I are committed to helping the poor people of society get a fair shake from the legal system. You're both lawyers? Yes, she said. I got my degree from UCLA, and Axel got his across the bay in Berkeley. I worked for the state for a while, but didn't feel very good about that. When Axel, Axel asked me to join him, I jumped at the chance. What's your name, I asked. Oh, excuse my manners. My name is Cynthia Aubeck. French? I was born in Canada, she said. Montreal. So he has, you know, in the dialogue, he has, you know, he's got speech, descriptive action, um, and uh, all of which lend themselves to the flow of, uh, of interaction. Uh, here's uh, one more example I'll give from uh, Joshua Hammond's stunning work of creative nonfiction, uh, a wonderful book called The Badass Librarians of Timbuktu. And these were people who saved uh, the precious manuscripts of Timbuktu from the ravages of uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, Islamists who wanted to destroy them. Um, and the main character is one of the main guard guardians of these, uh, you know, precious manuscripts uh, that date back to the 15th and 16th century. Here's a conversation from uh, between Hadara, the aforementioned uh, guardian uh, of some uh, and some Libyan officials representing Gaddafi. After looking through the manuscripts of the, you know, uh, so they looked through his manuscripts. They came to visit him. They wanted to buy his collection. We have a, and here's the dialogue. We have a proposition for you, they said. I'm listening, Hadara replied. We want to, I, we want to buy everything we see here. They opened a briefcase and showed Hadara stacks of bills of various currencies. No thanks, but and no thanks, he told the Libyans. You never said that you were coming here to attempt to purchase the manuscripts. What do you mean? We will pay you in any currency you want. It's not for sale. Why not? Because this isn't for me. This is the heritage of Mali. It belongs to a great nation but we can make you comfortable for the rest of your life. No, he said, all right? So um, there's all, there are also some really uh, very good dialogue writers who are anthropologists. Uh, one is, you know, uh, my good friend, Ruth Behar, who writes about Cuba uh, and uh, many, many other things. Uh, she's an extremely talented um, uh, writer of uh, dialogue. And one of the very, very best is, um, 
you know, Zora Neale Hurston, uh, who, um, you know, in the 1920s did this amazing uh, sort of field work in, uh, in Florida, uh, capturing the particular particularities of uh, African American speech uh, in that particular area uh, at that particular time. Magnificent dialogues. And, and in each case, just like what I was just reading, in each case, the, the people who write dialogue use it as a way of, uh, as a window into a person's character uh, and how they carry themselves in the world, um, making them, you know, making, making them distinct, quite frankly. And that brings me to the third element is how you craft character. In, in many anthropological texts, uh, there, you know, there is no, there's very little characterization. You know, we have informants, we talk about people, but what is it about a person that makes him or her distinct? Uh, wh what is it that uh, differentiates them from anyone else? Is it uh, their, their gaze? Is it the quality of their, their eyes? Do they have a particular expression? Is it their, do they walk in a certain particular way? Um, do they, uh, you know, uh, do they have a tick of some sort? What is it about uh, a person, you know, how are their faces set? Are they set in a frown, a grimace, a grin? Uh, do they walk rapidly? Do they have a stiff legged gait? Do they skip? Do they limp? Are they unsteady on their feet? Uh, so all of these things, you know, um, are, are window into their being, you know, and, um, so just a, a very brief, um, you know, I want to present a, a fiction writers are very, very good at this kind of thing. One of my favorite ones is uh, Michael Chabon, uh, who writes wonderful, wonderful fiction. Um, and, um, I, and I'll have another brief one for, again from uh, Anna uh, Bodkin, uh, describing the character of a Fulani woman in Mali. First, uh, Michael Chabon, uh, this is from his novel called Wonder Boys. And um, he, um, uh, Grady Tripp, a prodigy novelist is suffering from writer's block, goes to the airport to meet his famous literary agent, Terry Crabtree. And catch how he, these small details give you an indication of character. Tripp, said Crabtree, approaching me with his free hand extended. He reached up with both arms to embrace me and I held on to him for an extra, uh, extra second or two, tightly trying to determine from the soundness of his ribs, whether he had, he loved me still. Good to see you, how are you? I let go of him and took a step back. He wore a, the usual crabtree expression of scorn and his eyes were bright and hard, but he didn't look as though he were angry with me. He'd been letting his hair grow long as he got older, not a, as is the case with some fashionable men in their forties in compensation for any incipient baldness, but out of a vanity more pure and unchallengeable. He had, a, he had beautiful hair, thick and chestnut colored and falling in flawless in a flawless curtain to his shoulders. He was wearing a well-cut olive drab belt raincoat over a handsome suit, an Italian number uh, in a metallic silk that was green, green like the back of a dollar bill. A pair of woven leather loafers without socks and a round schoolboy spectacles I'd never seen before, right? So it tells you an awful lot about this, this person's character. Um, and <clears throat> one more uh, from Anna Bodkin, uh, describing a woman, uh, a Fulani, a woman uh, in, uh, in Mali. <clears throat> Banta nestled the calabash, calabashes on top of her, hand, uh, of her head and set off on the southbound path toward Weraka. She did no farewells. This was a ritual she performed every other day, and it did not merit ceremony. Nor did she e um, um, ease gradually into her walk. She started right out of, of the camp at a quick, steady stride and never changed until she reached the village. It was the tempo of her last walk and of her walks before that and of her mother's and all of her milk and all of the milkmaid's past recall who had fixed their footsteps on this trail before. She simply picked it up. She would have picked it up and dropped the calabash in that way or a grindstone uh, she had loaned to her neighbor. At first, Fanta walked with her right hand raised to hold the straw lid so the wind wouldn't blow them away. After a hundred paces, the arm and wrist drained of blood and, and began to ache. She stopped and shook off her right plastic flip-flop 
and with her toes scooped up the ground a flat stone. She flexed the right leg at the knee and stood on her left unbending leg without leaning, without looking, reached behind her with her right arm and picked the stone out of her foot. Neck perfectly straight, the calabash is steady on her head. She had done this a thousand times before. Her bubble printed shawl flapped against her cheek. She placed the rock on the topmost lid and let both arms fall like a marionette's arms by her sides and walked again. Around her ankles, uh, night moisture rose cold from the drying fields. Pied crows hopped in the low labyrinth of manure. So, um, you know, these, it's kind of, these examples uh, are constructed through physical description of faces, uh, movements, dress, speech, and space. Um, it's also con constructed by what is said and unsaid, what is stated and what is left to the reader's imagination. All right, so, so I want to talk now, and this is a sort of the, the sort of last thing I want to talk about, and that's called, and I call it the art of living in the world. So whenever I visited Paris, uh, and, you know, uh, Marcelo mentioned Jean Rouche, and Jean Rouche was, uh, was a mentor to me and many, many other people. And whenever I, you know, I spent time with Jean Rouche uh, in Niger, when always uh, the time was adventurous. And whenever I visited Paris, um, I would go to his, um, his cluttered offices on the second floor of the Musée de l'Homme, uh, where there was a beehive of activity. And then from time to time, he'd have screenings. You walk up these stairs, uh, clanky stairs, to a small projection room with makeshift uh, chairs. And periodically, documentarians would come uh, to show uh, Jean Rouche, uh, the master, um, their, you know, their sort of unfinished films, right? So, so uh, whenever the, you know, whenever... Uh, uh, this happened, Roosh invited people to the projection room, uh, me included, from time to time. And But he'd also, he, sometimes he'd bring people in who were just wandering about the museum. He'd grab them and say, come, come take a look. And then people would say, well, I don't know anything about film. And he would say, well, it doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't matter. It's okay. I want to hear what you have to say, All right? So Roosh always sat in the front, in the front chair and leaned back, you know, very close to the screen. And... Um, you know, uh, and he'd always ask the similar questions, you know, uh, he, people, you know, pe there'd be debates about the film, about camera angles, uh, you know, technical debates about, you know, what kind of you know, camera you're using, what kind of lens you're using, uh, editing, you know, questions about editing techniques. And in the end, he would come, uh, he'd always ask the question, uh, more often than not, where is the story in this film? And he also sometimes say, how can you fix the story? And then his most important thing was, how can you do something? How, what can you do so that the film connects with the audience? How do you connect the film to the audience? Or uh, in, in the case of writers, how does a writer connect with the reader? How do you create that kind of connection? So for Roosh, you know, um, the story was always prior to theories. Um, he, you know, it's not to say that theories are not important. They are extraordinarily important. It is to say that in the world of science, theories, given the instabilities of scientific truths, have short shelf lives. Um, you know, and so if you look in anthropology, since I've been an anthropologist for, all, you know, for a long, long time, I've seen so many theories come and go. I mean, they, you know, they, you know, when I was a graduate student, uh, French structuralism was, you know, that was what everyone thought was going to, you know, uh, solve all the issues of, uh, you know, sort of the all, answer all the questions of uh, the social condition or the human condition. Um, so the theories, you know, and that's the way they should be. That's what science is about. Science is about, you know, you establish a p potential truth and then you investigate it, you question it, and then you refine it, or you, or you say, well, this, this really doesn't, doesn't uh, it has some contribution, but it does not necessarily answer all the questions that, uh, that the ethnographic record uh, suggests. So narratives, however, stories, 
um, are text and films that if they're well corrected, uh, I'm sorry, well constructed, remain open to the world, right? So stories create a bond, as Jean Rouche well knew, uh, between the filmmaker and the audience or the author and her or his readers. And it's through the power of evocation that you know, Merleau-Ponty was talking about. Stories can move us to think new thoughts, construct new realities, and feel new feelings. They are the catalyst of social change. Listen to this quote from um, uh, a guy named Gottschall, Jonathan Gottschall. Story, sacred and profane, is perhaps the main cohering force in human life. A society is composed of fractious people with different personalities, goals, and agendas. What connects us beyond our kinship ties, he asks, story. Story is the counterforce to social disorder, the tendency of things to fall apart. Story is the center without which the rest cannot hold. So stories are the windows through which we encounter the human condition. Um, and so that is the power of the story. They demonstrate how we are all connected. Um, creating these kinds of stories that are you know, infused with anthropological insight, that is the work of art in anthropology. So the question is, how do you learn to craft a good story? Why are some films and ethnographic texts more memorable than others? <coughs> Merleau-Ponty and Michael Jackson might say that memorable ethnographies are the ones in which sensuous description, the sensuous projection of image in prose and film compels an audience to sense the drama of social life. Stories that poetically showcase the lived and unlived environment that feature idiosyncratic dialogue that underscore the vulnerabilities of character have the capacity to create connections between authors and audiences. They have the capacity to remain open to the world. But in the art of ethnography, there's something more profoundly existential at play. Songhai elders love to recite the following proverb to me. Gamba hinka agachara tadayume. It takes two hands to nourish a friendship. So the, what I've been arguing for in the art of ethnography is you know, sensuous evo evocation of space, dialogue, character. They present a necessary but not sufficient condition for crafting the kind of stories that comprise an art, artful ethnography. In the end, the artistic quality of ethnography devolves less from the technique and more from how you live your life. Do you live in the moment? Do you walk with confidence on your path? Do you open your ears and listen to the elders? Are you willing to enter the stressful arena of representational vulnerability? These life choices implicate ethnographers among their others and enable them to tell a good story. For me, the depth, texture, and staying power of ethnographic film or ethnographic text emerges directly from the depth of the relationships that the ethnographer has developed. No matter the sophistication of technical practice um, or philosophical nuance, this deceptively simple principle sets the foundation for the future of an artful ethnography, the insights of which can chart a course for negotiating the existential and social turbulence of a troubled world. As scholars, is it not our obligation to artfully recount these insightful stories to sweeten the human condition. It takes two hands to nourish a friendship. Thank you so much for inviting me to uh, talk. Uh, it's been a great pleasure. And uh, uh, I hope that what I had to say has, has sparked some, some debate and discussion um, at the ABA in August. Thank you again. Molte abrogado.